Welcome to the Unitarian Church of Lincoln on this Sunday morning. My name is the Reverend Oscar Sinclair. Each week since the beginning of the coronavirus pandemic last March, our congregation has gathered together at least twice. On Thursday night, when we tend to our community and each other directly on Zoom, and in this service on Sunday morning, broadcast on YouTube. Sunday morning, whether in person or on YouTube, is a chance to proclaim who we are and what we are about, throwing open the doors of the congregation and proclaiming the radical love and welcome that is at the heart of our faith. The Unitarian Church of Lincoln, we say, aspires to be a loving community, uniting reason with spiritual experience, to transform ourselves and the world. And right now, in this year when so much is uncertain, we know that transformation is necessary. This is the place. This is the time. Who will we be? How will we be? In this time of anxiety and pandemic and fear, what are we called to be as a community? This is, as Reverend Susan Frederick Gray puts it, no time for a casual faith. And this, right now, right here, is where we practice. So whoever you are, whatever has brought you here to this moment, if this is your first time with us, or your 500th, whomever you love, however old you are, whatever brings you to this moment, be present right here, right now. Let go of what you've carried here, set aside what will come later, be right here. There is work to be done. Let's be about it. Holy and beautiful the custom which brings us together in the presence of the Most High. To face our ideals, to remember our loved ones in absence, to give thanks, to make confession, to offer forgiveness, to be enlightened, and to be strengthened. Through this quiet hour breathes the worship of ages, the cathedral music of history. Three unseen guests attend, faith, hope, and love. Let all our hearts prepare them place.
Hello. Our story today is called The Magical Yet, and it's by Angela Ditterlisi with art by Lorena Alvarez. There are days when your dreams haven't come true, or you're upset by the things you can't do. If you've lost or failed or cried just a bit, you're tired of waiting and ready to quit. Like that shiny new bike you couldn't ride and it didn't matter how hard you tried. You couldn't pedal and you couldn't steer and you couldn't get that bike into gear. Then when you thought you were on the right track, you popped a wheelie and fell on your back. And now you won't ride, no way, not, never. No riding for you, you'll walk forever. Don't give up now. There's a major game changer, a most amazing thought rearranger, someone to show you how good you can get. Now, introducing the magical yet. With this yet's magic, you can begin to see that you're going beyond where you've been. There are so many things that you've learned to do when you didn't know the yet was with you, like when you babbled before you could talk or how you crawled before you could walk. Yet a dreamer, a schemer, a hoper, a trier, a maker, a doer, a gotta fly higher. This yet finds a way even when you don't and yet knows he will when you think that you won't. Like that shiny new bike that you couldn't ride, hop right back on with yet by your side. Yet doesn't mind warm ups, fixes and flops, do overs, redos, stumbles and stops. Yet knows there's mistakes, some big, some small. With yet, you're sure to get over them all. Play the kazoo or play the bassoon. Jam with the yet and you'll soon be in tune. Try skateboarding tricks like the ollie heel flip. This yet can get to the championship. Tongue twisters twisted, your tongue in a knot. Yet says keep trying and practice a lot. Be patient, yet can't do it all overnight. Some things take days, months, or years to get right. But if you keep leaping, dreaming, wishing, waiting, learning, trying, missing, with the yet as your guide along the way, you'll do all the things you can't do today. Now you're bolder, braver, starting to see. With yet, you can get where you want to be. You finally did it, yet knew you could. You're not just writing, you're getting quite good. But don't stop now, you've got so much to do. The good news is, this yet grows with you. So no matter how big or old you may get, you'll never outgrow, you'll never forget. You can always believe in the magic of yet. And that is the end of our story. I can't wait to see what we have yet before us at the Unitarian Church of Lincoln. Thank you. Our first reading this morning is from History of the City of Lincoln by A.B. Hayes, published in 1889. The first Universalist Society of Lincoln was organized at the residence of J.D. Monell, September 1870, with W.W. Holmes, S.J. Tuttle, J.N. Parker, Mrs. Sarah Parker, Mrs. Julia Brown, Mrs. Laura B. Pound, and Mrs. Mary Monell as charter members. About this time, the property now in the possession of the society, on the corner of 12th and H Streets, was secured by grant from the legislature of the state. A subscription was also begun, looking toward the erection of a chapel. 
In the meantime, the society held occasional services for worship in the Senate chamber in the old Capitol building. During the month of December of the same year, Reverend Ozza Sachs, General Secretary of the Universalist denomination, visited Lincoln for the purpose of ascertaining whether it would be advisable to make this a missionary point. His decision was favorable to such a movement. Consequently, with the financial aid of the denomination, the society was able to call Reverend James Gurton, then of Illinois, to be its first pastor. He accepted the invitation and began work in September 1871. The following October, the cornerstone of the chapel was laid, and on Sunday, June 23, 1872, it was dedicated. All this was brought about largely through the efforts of one devoted woman, Mrs. Mary Monell. It was she who first gathered the few scattered universalists in the place together. Unaided, she raised the subscription to build the chapel. She collected the funds, saw that the work was done, and paid the bills. The early records of the society reveal the zeal and fidelity with which she did her work, the many difficulties with which she had to contend, and her final triumph. Mrs. Monell must always be looked upon as the patron saint of the First Universalist Society of Lincoln. 150 years ago, a group of new Lincolnites, and at that point most everyone was new to this town, gathered to form something new in this city. In September of 1870, they incorporated the First Universalist Society of Lincoln, Nebraska. And while our name has changed a few times since then, this congregation is the direct descendant of that moment. Over the next months, we will mark 150 years of universalism in Lincoln. Now, this is one of those floating anniversaries. The earliest we can date the formation of the congregation is September of 1870, but it took a few years for them to fully incorporate, to build a church, to call a minister. Indeed, it was almost a generation between before they were a fully stable going concern. We'll tell that story as well. Now, anniversaries by themselves don't mean much. The Earth, I suppose, has traveled some number of times around the sun. And while there are similarities between us and the folks that came together in 1870, we are a much different church in membership, in theology, and culture than the Universalists who met in the Senate room of the First State Capitol building. Our readings this morning are taken from the 19th century Universalist books of worship and reflect how much has changed in the last century and a half. But as Frederick Buechner writes, the time is ripe for looking back over the day, the week, the year, and trying to figure out where we have come from and where we are going to, for sifting through the things we have done and the things we have left undone for a clue to who we are and who, for better or worse, we are becoming. But again and again, we avoid the long thoughts. We cling to the present out of wariness of the past, and why not, after all? We get confused. We need such escape as we can find. But there is a deeper need yet, I think, and that is the need, not all the time, surely, but from time to time, to enter that still room within us where the past lives on as a part of the present, where the dead are alive again, where we are most alive ourselves to turnings and to where our journeys have brought us. The name of the room is Remember, the room where with patience, with charity, with quietness of heart, we remember consciously to remember the lives we have lived. We enter that still room where the past lives on as the present. Buechner is writing about people, about individual memory. But this is a lesson for the church as well. The church is not the building, it is the community. We've said that before this year, we will say it again. But distinctly, it is a community of people who share a story, who have a narrative about the community that they share. The story of the church is not the story of one person or even several, although in the next months we'll hear names like Monell and Hatfield, Weatherly, Sorensen, Philbrick, Stephen, others. The church's story emerges from all the stories that we bring to this place, each of us. 
Arbor Merritt, a few years ago, preached at the 150th anniversary of the Tree of Life congregation in McHenry County, Illinois. And she also began with Frederick Buechner. We are always remembering, in one sense, the past is dead and gone, never to be repeated over and done with. But in another sense, it is, of course, not done at all, or at least not done with us. Every person we have ever known, every place we have ever seen, everything that has ever happened to us, it all lives and breathes in us somewhere. It is so much a part of us, Merritt went on to say, that we feel something close to its original intensity and freshness. What it felt like, say, to fall in love at the age of 16, or to smell and hear the sounds of a house that has long since disappeared, or to laugh until the tears run down our cheeks with someone who died more years ago than we can easily count, or for whom, in every way that matters, we might have died ourselves years ago. Old failures, old hurts, times too beautiful to tell or too terrible. The power of remembering becomes our own power. The church is a generational story, and yes, just as few of us have a personal story that is universally good, There are times when the church has done poorly, and times when we've done wrong. But over 150 years, we've done a lot right. And the reason, I think, that we celebrate anniversaries is that the past is not finished, or at least not finished with us. The stories of the congregation are our stories, and it is a hope, distinct to churches, that this will be a place where our stories are remembered even after we go. We celebrate 150 years not to mark the end of a journey, but a waypoint along it, a cairn marking how far we come. When I was 18, I decided not to be a minister. I started out college as a pre-law student and spent long nights at the St. Mary's Library reading court opinions. And in that time, I got a whole new vocabulary and pantheon of heroes. There are many ways to seek justice in the world. We march in streets, praying with our feet, as Rabbi Heschel described it. We set up little free pantries and libraries. We educate ourselves. We advocate. We support each other through hard times. Ruth Bader Ginsburg died on Friday. And there are layers to this heartbreak. Justice Ginsburg showed us all that advocacy, argument, and when needed, crystal clear dissent is a path of justice. Her friend and oftentimes opponent on the Supreme Court, Antonin Scalia, often observed that Justice Ginsburg had two separate distinguished legal careers, first as an advocate for the ACLU, successfully arguing case upon case, dismantling institutional and legal sexism, then again as a Supreme Court justice, an icon and an advocate in a different role. Many of us are hurting this weekend. And it seems almost impossible to separate the mourning for the death of this remarkable woman from the fear and anxiety about what this loss means at this moment. What it means for the struggle for greater and deeper justice in this country that she she fought so long for. And we'll have more to say about that. Next weekend, we are participating in a worship service coordinated with our denomination, with Reverend Susan Frederick Gray preaching. And it's important to say this weekend that this is not the only loss, the only mourning in our community. On Friday morning, Edward Lanning, husband of Joanne Lanning, died in their home. 
And in our broader community, it is likely that by the time you are watching this, 200,000 Americans will have died from the coronavirus. So I'm going to ask this morning that even though we are apart and watching this service from different places and likely at different times, that we say a prayer together. Will you join me in a spirit of prayer or meditation? God of many names, in the unnamed whisper of the heart, even as we join together to celebrate a joyful anniversary this morning, our hearts are heavy. There has been so much loss. The psalmist writes that sorrow endures for the night, but joy cometh with the dawn. But sometimes the night is very long and very dark. In this time of sorrow, bring comfort. In this time of pandemic, bring healing. In this time of upheaval, bring justice. And in these and all times, help us to remember that whatever comfort, healing, and justice you bring in this life, it is through our words, our actions, our dissents. Our hearts are with all those who mourn, from the Ginsburg family to the Lannings and the Hawks, and all those whose names we do not know. In this time of silence, we each say a prayer for them, a prayer for our community, and a prayer for our country. Amen. Thank you for your presence. Your joy is your sorrow unmasked. And the self-same well from which your laughter rises was oftentimes filled with your tears. And how else can it be? The deeper that sorrow carves into your being, the more joy you can contain. Is not the cup that holds your wine the very cup that was burned in the potter's oven? And is not the lute that soothes your spirit the very wood that was hollowed with knives? When you are joyous, look deep into your heart, and you shall find that it is only that which has given you sorrow that is giving you joy. When you are sorrowful, look again in your heart, and you shall see that in truth you are weeping for that which has been your delight. Khalil Gibran as this next song plays, please type your name or the name of someone that you are holding in sorrow and care or that you would like us to help celebrate in joy into the chat. Thank you for your presence.
In September of 1870, a group of lay people in Lincoln, Nebraska, founded a Universalist Society. Why were they Universalists? What did they believe? With a careful reading of the Bible, common sense and kindliness, Universalists believe they had a good answer to what happens after death, that a loving God was ready to receive all who came his way. With a security in that promise, Universalists were freed to work to make this world a better place for the entire human family. In 1803, Universalists adopted the very short Win Winchester Profession of Faith. The third and final article of that profession stated, We believe that holiness and true happiness are inseparably connected, and that believers ought to be careful to maintain order and practice, and practice good works, for these things are good and profitable unto men. In other words, concern and action for a reform of society in many areas became a focus for universalism, for living their faith to Lincoln, Nebraska in 1870. I think that it is fair to say that they, our ancestors, believed in a universe guided by a God of love who wished the best for humanity, his creation. With the security of that belief, the Universalist Society of Lincoln already had a great heritage and experience to continue the struggle for human progress and justice on this earth. Our second reading this morning is from the Universalist Book of Worship published in 1894. The Beatitudes with responses to be said by the congregation and Ashley will be speaking the congregational parts, and feel free to speak along with her. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he had sat down, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart, and saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. This is my comfort in my affliction, for thy word hath quickened me. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. The meek will he guide in judgment, and the meek will he teach his way. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. He shall receive blessing from the Lord, and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. He that trusteth in the Lord, mercy compass him about. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The salvation of the righteous is of the Lord. He is their strength in the time of trouble. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. The angel of the Lord encampeth around them that fear him and delivereth them. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting and to everlasting. Amen and amen. Here's what we know about the founding of this congregation 150 years ago. History texts both of our congregation and of Nebraska agree that the first Universalist services were held in Lincoln in 1860, led in part by a charismatic Universalist preacher named J.N. Parker. And in September of 1870, a meeting was held at the home of J.D. Monell, to formally incorporate the first Universalist Society of Lincoln. A year later, the new state of Nebraska granted the Universalists a, partial of, a parcel of land on 12th and H Street, and ground was broken on a wooden A-frame chapel. In A.B.'s Haynes's History of the, of the City of Lincoln, published in 1888, he writes, All this was brought about largely through the efforts of one devoted woman, Mrs. Merrill, Mary Monell. It was she who first gathered the few scattered Universalists in the place together. 
Unaided, she raised the subscription to build the chapel. She collected the funds, saw that the work was done, and paid the bills. The early records of the society revealed the zeal and fidelity with which she did her work, the many difficulties with which she had to contend, and her final triumph. Mrs. Monell must always be looked upon as the patron saint of the First Universalist Society of Lincoln. Now, um, these difficulties and triumphs are a euphemism in describing the first years of the society's existence. The history published by this congregation makes a, a reference to trouble with Mr. Parker related to finances. But an 1870 letter addressed to Mary Monell puts it more bluntly. To Mrs. Mary Monell, dear sister, good news. A letter from Reverend Montgomery, chairman of our Committee on Discipline of the Universalists, informing me that he has officially notified Reverend J. N. Parker that he must, within 10 days after receipt of the letter, pay the amount due the society or give satisfactory security and certified to Brother Montgomery as such under the hand of the society. Or he would be cited to show cause why he should not be suspended from the ministry. I declare this to be good news, although I am reluctantly compelled to assent to Brother Montgomery's opinion that Parker will neither pay nor give security, and that the society will never be benefited a single dollar by his collections. You will reach hard pan, and the feverish, feverish dream will be at an end. You will know upon which you have to rely, and can go before the executive board with additional claims in view of the swindle at the hands of a recognized clergyman. It is good news also because you no longer, you have no longer to sustain the odium of representing a denomination which disregards the moral character of its clergy. G.W. Tomlinson, dated October 20th, 1870. The itinerant Universalist minister who initially helped raise funds for a congregation in Lincoln had, it seems, left town with most of the funds the society had initially raised. They eventually recovered, built the A-frame church on 12th and H, and the first minister to serve the society was Reverend James Curtin. His salary was funded as a missionary program of the Universalist General Convention, cited above probably in uh, apology for their clergymen running off with the finances a few years later, earlier. But when that funding ran out in 1873, in the midst of a financial panic, he resigned his position. From 1873 to 1883, services were held occasionally in the wooden chapel, at times led by members of the community, and at least some of the time by a Unitarian miss missionary out of Omaha named W.E. Copeland. Also at this time, Unity, a Unitarian magazine based out of Chicago, made this observation in a report of Copeland's work. The liberals of Nebraska are, as a whole, very radical, having cut loose entirely from the moorings of the old theology, and they can be reached by no form of religious faith but our own. <coughs> this connection between the Unitarian missionaries in Omaha and the Lincoln Universalists would eventually play a role in 1898 when the first Universalist Society became All Souls Unitarian Church of Lincoln. That's a story for a different day. For now, here's a thing to think about. In 1870, this congregation was founded as part of a radical understanding of theology. The Universalists of our founding era rejected a theology of fear and for a generation were counted among the largest denominations in the country. We are their legacy. What does that mean for us? What in 2020 does it mean to reject a theology of fear and proclaim a theology of hope?
Anniversaries in churches are rarely just a single day. Because if we're honest, not once in the history of this or any other religious institution has anything important happened in a single 24-hour day, a single meeting, or a single decision. We can count the first Universalist service in Lincoln, or we can count the anniversary of the groundbreaking of their first building, or the completion of their first building, or the hiring of their first minister, and in just a few years it will be the 125th anniversary of All Souls Unitarian. In churches, in this church as in every church, we spend most of our time celebrating either beginnings or endings. And so, rather than just have this one day to tell the story, then talk about other things, we're going to come back to this congregation's history many times this fall. A group of members have been working over the last months in our archives, learning about our history and getting ready to tell the story of this place. Originally, we had conceived of this as a series of events in the middle hour between services at 6300 A Street. Circumstances being what they are and us being online, we'll be integrating them into services across the fall and into the spring. Kurt Donaldson this moment was this morning was the first of these reflections. The longer piece that he has prepared is available in, fu in full on the congregation's YouTube channel. For the next three weeks, at least, this is the pattern we will follow. A short excerpt on Universalist history as part of the worship service on Sunday, taken from a larger piece that we'll publish separately. We're also working to launch a new timeline of the congregation's history on our website that will include these reflections, as well as some of the documents from our archives. We are constantly telling our own story, and we're adding new chapters to it. Someday, some leader of the congregation is going to go through our, hopefully at that point, digital archives to get a sense of what this congregation was like in the days of the COVID-19 pandemic. These are markers, not the end of a story, not the beginning of one. Anniversaries mark time, and they are occasion to remember the lives that we have lived. Amen. Each Sunday, we take up a collection to support this congregation and our partners in the wider world. While we're in this time of physical distancing and outside of our building, we give primarily through text on Sunday morning. So if you would like to try text giving this morning, simply text UC Lincoln and the amount you wish to give to 73256. That's UC Lincoln and the amount you wish to give to 73256. You can also send a physical check to our building at 6300 A Street. Thank you for your generosity.
as we close our time together, know that we extinguish the chalice behind me, but not the light of truth, the warmth of love, or the fire of commitment. These we carry with us until we are together again. Be at peace, beloveds, and amen.